This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Carberline. In the movie Back to the Future, Marty McFly travels from 1985 to 1955, and he comes across his mother, which is very Freudian in some sense, but also raises some interesting questions about how you view your parents. On our show today is Dr. Grant Guthiel, Associate Professor of Psychology at Nazareth College, and we're going to talk about the psychology and physics of Back to the Future. I'm always interested by this idea, you know, Marty goes back in time, he meets his mother, and he realizes that she's very different from what he originally thought, because he thinks of her as being very puritanical and mm. and very strict. He goes back in time, and she's cool, and she smokes, and she drinks. And, and she's hot. And she's hot. And this is, you know, watching this when you're young, you kind of think it's funny. Watching it when you're older, if you think about it with your own parents, it's a little uncomfortable. Oh, it's creepy as hell. <laughs> There's an interesting aspect there in terms of how we model what we think our parents are versus what they may have actually been when they were our age. The psychology here is pretty straightforward. In any relationship you have with anyone, you work with what's in front of you. And if you're a kid, when you're an infant and a toddler, what's in front of you is a wrathful God. Your entire existence is predicated on their beneficence. Right. If, they, if they're happy, you're happy. If they're not happy, you're not happy. Now, mind you, the parent simultaneously has exactly the opposite viewpoint, which is, I let this thing into my house, and now it's running everything. <laughs> and if it's not happy, nobody's happy. It poops and eats and cries. And, and cries. And <laughs> cries, and I have to deal with that. Right. But from the kid's perspective... There's a whole lot of work on how parents, you know, we created God because we needed a broader parental figure once we got too old to see our parents as parental figures and right. as gods. So we needed a bigger one. And that's where religion came from. I have no idea if that's true, but that is very reasonable given what a young child's viewpoint of their parents is. Right. And then as you get older, your parents get older. It kind of works that way. And mm -hmm. I have a line I use in my child development class, which is, your parents weren't born old and boring. They got that <laughs> way taking care of you. <laughs> and, you know, I look at a room full of 20-year-olds, and they kind of look at me like, really? No, 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 man. I know my dad. No, you don't. Parenthood ages you in both positive and negative ways. If you take parenting seriously... You become more conservative. You become more predictable. You become more dependable right. because you've got this thing in your house that is a need machine. It latches onto you and sucks money and emotion and time and sweat and energy out of you like a lamprey eel. That's its job. <laughs> and it's really, really good at it. As, as you raise, I mean, we both have children and... and you know, when they start approaching an age that, that you remember as yes. a child, you have other worries because yes. you start saying, no, you can't do that. Because I know what I did yeah, I when I, I was did. 15. Oh, no. oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. And, and you see this in Back to the Future where, where Marty's mom, in some sense, worries about the consequences of what Marty might do because of her own consequences. Exactly. That, that she frames that in terms of her own behavior led to problems, and so she's trying to, to fix that in the next generation. And, of course, we all do that. We all try to fix and rerun, to some degree, our own childhood and our own lives in our kids. How many people have said one of the two following statements, I'm going to be a mom just like my mom, or I'm going to be a mother or a father exactly the opposite right. of my mother or father, because I'm going to fix it, or if I love it, I'm going to do exactly the same. And, of course, neither viewpoint is intellectually viable. Neither one's going to work because you are your own person. And, oh, by the way, that little lamprey eel, it's going to develop a personality. Right. And it's going to be an individual. And it's going to have something to say about how this whole thing shakes out, whether right. you want it to or not. It's, it's the whole thing of how to lose a fight with your spouse very quickly. You go, ah, you sound just like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, if you look demographically at who people marry... There is similarity at about right. who people marry. I mean, the thing I do in class is I tell my students, if you want to know who you're going to marry, look in the mirror. In a very real demographic sense, you're going to marry yourself. 
You're going to marry someone who is your level of attractiveness, approximately. You're going to marry someone with your level of education. You're going to marry someone with your level of economic standing. You're going to marry someone with your religious background. You're going to marry, in many ways, yourself. And you are similar in many ways to your parents. So Marty going back and being attracted to his mom isn't surprising. It's creepy, but it makes sense. (laughs) It's also interesting in terms of how we see the past. I mean, because we've had this Back to the Future day just Mm -hmm. a, a couple of days ago, the idea is that... 1955 Mm -hmm. is as far away from 1985 as 2015 is to 1985. Which is an astonishing, yeah, way to make me feel old, dude. (laughs) But I mean, at the same time, it's like when I remember growing up and watching Back to the Future Mm -hmm. because we're of that age. And 1955 was a very different world, having never experienced it and seeing it through the eyes of my parents Mm -hmm. and how they experienced the 1950s, for example. Yes. And that's, in many ways, that's the only way that we experience that is through the movies of the time, through how the 50s portrayed themselves. Right. And how our parents see it. And we have the same thing now with the 80s. Yes. What we remember of the 80s isn't necessarily what the 80s were about. God, let's hope not. In the movie itself, one of the things they have is they have a novelty shop right. that, that shows all of the things of the 80s. <laughs> and, and while there are some things that you go, oh, yeah, really. But at the same time, a lot of what was emphasized was immediately popular in 1985. Right. It wasn't necessarily what we look back and see, on, on, and and see about the 80s. Right. Right. And so, so that, that filter that we look through in terms of time also affects us that 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 we i think it's psychologically i think we tend to rewrite our own history oh we do and i mean it's not even just psychologically some of it is some of it is uh unintentional i mean the more we learn about how memories are first made maintained and then used the short story is every time you pull a memory out every time you think about it you change it Mm -hmm. so nostalgia is a real thing the more you think about the, quote, good old days, the better they're going to get. So when you, when you remember something, you're pulling that up, and then you're rewriting the memory of that memory. Yes, and you keep doing that in an iterative process over and over and over. So by the time, you know, that memory is 20 years old, it seems as though it's carved in granite. And that is exactly what happened. And it was perfect and wonderful. My first kiss her hair was perfect. Her breath was sweet. And you go back and see the actual event and like, okay, yeah, that was maybe a kiss. But beyond that, there's absolutely no similarity to what you've described and what actually happened. Right. So we don't want to necessarily go back in time. We would be faced with the reality of, yeah, most of the how time, wrong we are. Yeah, most of the time going back in time, especially you know farther back in time, is a problem because it's not going to match what we thought happened. And over time, we tend to sand the rough edges off our memories and our experiences. Right. And if you go back, you know, you find out things were a lot sharper and a lot pointier than we remember them being. Right. And I think you see that sometimes in, in a lot of science fiction things. Oh, I mean, yeah. If you take Star Trek, for example, the original Star Trek series, in many ways, was seen as kind of this progressive approach. It really was for the and, time. And in many ways, it was. But on the other time, you look at the aliens, the aliens are deeply racist. I mean, it's Profoundly. Like the more the more latex, the worse they are. You're, yeah. Oh, golly. Yeah. This is just awful. And it's a product of, of its, its time. time. You know, and you see that with a lot of things. I think it's one of the interesting things about how if you look at past science fiction, a lot of it is so deeply impacted by the culture of the time in ways that you can't tell. Oh, yeah. You know, I love the one where there is a prediction about the Internet, and they were mm-hmm. talking about, you know, this this massive communication network, and people will be able to shop online, and they'll be able to be, read books electronically, and all of these things were there. And and this was from the 1950s. Right. You know, and they have all of these great things. You go, yep, you got it, online shopping, so on and so forth. But you still have, well, and then the wife can submit... The, the purchase that has to be approved by the husband. Right. Thinking, what? <laughs> well, at what point did this happen in our modern world? Exactly. You know, and the fact they get all the technology in many ways right, but they don't get the society right. Because it's, like, it's predict- harder to see the culture change than yeah. it is to see the technological and, change. And, you know, you're, you're talking about 
you know, with science fiction writers, you're talking about people who are more interested in the gadgets in many cases. And, you know, you know this split in sci-fi just as well as I do. There's hard, hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi. Right. Soft sci-fi is about cultural change. The folks who write about cultural change are obviously more likely to get it right. I mean, the thing that changed between the 50s and, you know, 2015 today is basically women went to work. And that and birth control are the right. two things. I mean, if you want to talk about how women's lives changed dramatically in the U.S. and other financial Western nations, independence financial and independence and control of reproduction, that's right. it. And yet that was a, a radically, radically ch- different change. I mean, the, the, that shift made, made, in some ways, almost unforeseeable consequences yeah, in terms that, of our modern world. It still does. I mean, right. at this point, I saw a stat that I'm not sure is right, but even if it's a little overblown, it still tells you how this works. For women under 30 in the United States... Close to the majority of children born to women under 30 are born into single parent families Mm -hmm. in the United States today. Right. And you can draw a a direct line from women's financial independence to single parent families. Right. Whether you want to, what you think it means are different questions, but you can certainly make that argument and it's a pretty powerful one. And I think you see that in Back to the Future. It's very clearly... This is a much more traditional family. Yes. It, it, it's interesting that the 1985 family of, I guess, before the time journey, yeah. in, in many ways, is a 1955 family. It really is. It has right a down. traditional breadwinner, mm-hmm. and, and it's a traditional nuclear family. And uh, the mother is the ridiculously unhappy, and I think she's a functional alcoholic. Right, right. You know? It seems like the dystopian version of 1955. Exactly. Like, this is and what happens. travel back to the utopian version of 1955. Exactly. And hopefully, you know, he gets it right. I mean, the whole notion of going back in time is to fix it, to get it right, to make it better. And of course, he does. He comes back to his new 1985. His mother's 40 pounds lighter and effervescent and happy. And his dad is a science fiction author of world renown. And he's got the girl and he's got the truck. And he doesn't do the stupid chicken thing with the street race thing at the very end and kill everybody. Right. And I think you see that the same way in the 2015. And the, their, their version of 2015 is very much a modern version of 1985. I have to admit, once I got past the first two, I, I yeah, the, the 2015 one was just hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a certain level that I'm willing to tolerate, and I watched it once. It was many years ago, and I tried to block most of it out. When you watch it, we went back and watched it again, and how much of modern society just isn't there? You know, you don't have cell phones. Nope. You you don't have Facebook or Google or Twitter or any of the things like that. Which is weird because the 1955 sci-fi predicted many of those things. Right, and a lot got of the cyberpunk right. yeah. did exactly that, of that integration of technology. Yeah, the sad thing is the cyberpunk guys, as much as you can vilify them for other things, they got this stuff kind of right. <laughs> it's like, let's take the most dystopian view we can take. Oh, that's what's going to happen, of yeah. course. <laughs> and it's not even that. It's let's make Okay, here's a dystopian view. No, that's still too boring. Let's make it 50,000 times worse. Right there. Yeah, right. that's what we're going to write about. And, and, really? It's close to it. and it, But it sells. I guess at the same time, you know, we, we see science fiction as, as kind of a way of, of reflecting upon our culture. Is it also kind of a reflection of our own psychology? I mean, the, the standard view is you look at the space aliens from the 50s movies and they're mm-hmm. bug-eyed Russian monsters. Yes. That's, that's, it's clearly the Red Scare. Yeah. And, and that was a deep psychological aspect, I think, yeah. almost an existential crisis, it seems, that growing up we never really had. Right. You know, I remember, um, what was it, the the day after tomorrow? Or the day the, after. The day yeah, after. The day after. And, and in the 80s, terrible movie. In, in, terrible movie, <laughs> but the, the, the parents are like, oh, golly, this was really disturbing. And the kids were like, I just want to see the nuke. <laughs> they nuked the school. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, if, uh, is it a reflection of our psych? I mean, yes, it has to be. All of entertainment is going to reflect what's going on societally, or at least a lot of it is going to reflect what's going on societally. So in the 50s, you had bug-eyed Russian monsters. In the 60s, you know, like you said yourself, Star Trek was progressive, but yeah, all the aliens that were dark-skinned were bad people. Right. Uh Uh-huh, let's keep moving on. In the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, we had our own bugaboos. We had our own worries. Now, 
a lot of the fiction is about you know, economic disparity. A lot of it is about global warming. I mean, how many stupid global warming <laughs> movies have there been? Earth catastrophe movies. Earth catastrophe movies, because we're terrified of that. As It doesn't exist, but we're still terrified of it. Right. It has to reflect the psychology. I mean, that's the reason that even war movies, mm -hmm. military movies, have changed dramatically. The good wars... World War II, and I'm not knocking anybody who fought World War II. In many cases, it was a good war. It was god-awfully necessary, hands down and without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But propaganda movies in the right. 50s, along with sci-fi movies in the 50s, were about being the good guys and fighting the good fight. Then, you know, you get up to the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, you get a movie like Hurt Locker, right. which is about a guy doing the right thing, but it's nowhere near what it used to be. There's uh, the J Jake Gyllenhaal sniper movie. Right. He trains to be hyper effective with this gun and then he never gets to use it, not even once, or maybe he gets to use it once. Right. But our notions of conflict are a lot darker than they used to be and a lot more complicated than they used right. to be. And that's because our world is more complicated. I'm Brian Kerberline. You're listening to One Universe at a Time and we're talking with Grant Guthiel about Back to the Future. In the second half, we're going to talk about the science behind the movie. Okay, here's the problem. There is no science in the movie. <laughs> there just isn't. I, I mean, I, to I quote Marty McFly, you made a time machine out of a DeLorean? Well, really? I mean, they have a little style. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is, okay, here's my first question. Is there any science in Back to the Future? The time travel in Back to the Future is a plot point. It purely is a plot point. So there's no flux capacitor. There's no hitting 88 miles an hour and 2.2 gigawatts in order to uh, make a time machine. My favorite's Mr. Fusion. Mr. Fusion. <laughs> yeah, being able to put the banana peel in Mr. <laughs> that's Fusion. That's beautiful. Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. But at, at the same time, there are, there are aspects of time travel that are related to physics. And, and any movie or story that deals with time travel has to either recognize what those are and draw upon them or, or turn away from them and try something different. Just in terms of basic physics as we currently understand it, is time travel theoretically possible? Maybe, but probably not. <laughs> Crap. There's, there's a maybe there. Now I'm grumpy. It all comes down to relativity. Okay. And, and one of the big things about relativity is that space and time are relative to each other. Yes. So, so if you have some, an object that's moving fast relative to you, mm -hmm. its time will appear to move slower. Is that a difference that's always there? Or is it, and it's just so small most of the time it's imperceptible? Right. Or is it a difference that only shows up at extreme dis disparate it, speeds? It shows up all the time. Okay. So if you're walking down the hall and I'm sitting in my office, our times are slightly different. Really, really teeny different. Very, very tiny, I'm tiny walking, different. so my time's going faster. Your time is appearing to go slower to me. Appearing to go slower, yes, but it doesn't it, go slower. It goes the other way around. You would say that my time is slow. In special relativity, it's just things moving relative to each other. Okay. In general relativity, they can be either moving under gravity or they can be accelerating. Okay. And that changes the connection. Oh, boy. You know, there's, there's a complicated math behind it, but even though these time shifts are very small, they have a very real physical effect. And probably the most common use would be in global positioning systems. Okay. So your phone has a GPS. Yes. And most phones today do. The GPS is done by tracking the timing signals of satellites. There's a cluster of satellites that orbit the Earth. Right. They're all going around in different directions. And usually your GPS in your phone can pick up the signals of at least three or four of these. And they sort of triangulate and figure out where you are? Well, it knows all of these are beaming a certain signal. So if it picks up a signal that says this is what time it is and picks up another signal that says this is what time it is, by knowing the difference in those clocks, it knows how far away it is from those GPS. Oh, so that's and where the whole time and space relativity thing The whole time and space shows. relativity thing comes. Okay. So, so in order to have accurate clocks, the GPS satellites have to account for relativity. If they didn't account for relativity, you'd have like a thousand foot drift per day, I think. It's, wow. it's this large drift over time. It's that much? Well, it's, it's on the order of microseconds. So it's a millionth of a second on, on that order. But that's enough that the clocks are more accurate than that. 
Okay. So we actually have to program the clocks to account for that relativistic drift wow. in time. So, so this is absolutely positively a real physical effect. There is absolutely no doubt that relativity works because otherwise you wouldn't be able to find Starbucks with your GPS. Got it. So, so we know that time can shift relative to one thing or the other. In general relativity, gravity affects time as well. Okay. And this again, in the GPS, because the, the GPS satellites are above the Earth, the gravity is slightly less than it is on the surface of the Earth. The gravity the, the strength of, gra- the the strength gravitational of gravity field. impacting the satellites is slightly less than the strength of gravity impacting the phone. Right, because they're a little bit farther away from Got the center it. of the Earth. Got it. So your clock on Earth runs slightly slower than, it, than the satellites because of gravity. So as you increase gravity, you in you you slow, you slow down, down time. time. Right. You know I just want to <laughs> say just for my own, you know, peace of mind that I'm going to keep nodding and saying yes and try to <laughs> sound like I'm sort of following this, but my brain just exploded when you said that and I'm I just got to be clean about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so so we and we know these actually are true. Yes. So so experimentally You've got the data. This, the data supports this, so we know time is variable. Now, what's interesting is, within general relativity, you can come up with solutions to the equations in okay. which there are time loops, in which, basically, your path through time would loop back upon itself, and you would meet yourself again. That's, that would be time travel. That would be a time, time travel. That would be time machine. And there are ways you can solve equations in general relativity where the math works. Yes. It's not voodoo. And that time loop is a result of the, comes out, pops out of the equation. Yes. Yes. Okay, that sounds like time travel. That sounds like time travel. Now, the problem is that the solutions that we have in which there are time loops or what we would call closed time-like curves, the solutions are mathematical, but they don't agree with physics. So one of the most famous one is, is the, the Girdle universe. Mm-hmm. It's this idea of a universe in which the entire universe is rotating. Okay. And because of that, space and time would get dragged a bit, okay. which is how time can be dragged around itself. It kind of loops around itself, and you can go back and see yourself. The universe doesn't do this. So, so even though it's a perfectly valid mathematical solution to relativity, it doesn't agree with what the universe actually is. The real universe doesn't seem to have these. Okay, so the math can theoretically produce a model in which time travel is possible, but that model requires a rotating universe, and our universe is stable or at least doesn't rotate. Right, or in general, it requires things that we do not seem to see in the real universe. Okay, so that would seem to indicate that unless somebody can somehow make the universe rotate, and I don't think that's really possible, time right. travel is a bust. Or, or other things. I mean, there are right. other models like that. But, but that raises the next question is, could you, in fact, okay, if it's theoretically a valid solution within the math works, if the math works, could you set up at least a chunk of the universe to match that solution? Could you do something to engineer a time machine? And that chunk of the universe could theoretically be DeLorean shaped. Yes, I mean you could you could come up with various literary ideas, but but the, the question in physics would be: Is there any way in which you could make something create a time loop? Is there some device you could create? And we've looked at this, and again the answer is probably not, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> And the maybe is a very small maybe, I'm, I, I'm getting. Yeah, the, the maybe is we can't prove it wrong. I mean, basically, we, we right. can't prove it impossible because it's, it's almost a game of cat and mouse in the sense that you could say, well, it's a mathematical solution to relativity. Okay, could you constrain it? Well, if you made it a, a time loop artificially, you would need some other type of physics. So, for example, wormholes would be one. If you could make okay. a wormhole, then then could you use that as a time machine? And the answer is yes. If wormholes existed, you could engineer a time machine out of wormholes. And just to be clear, at this point, wormholes are theoretical. We haven't found anywhere in space exploration right. a wormhole. We found no wormholes. And in fact, according to relativity, they would snap off, they would pinch off faster than you could traverse them. Okay. So, so then people ridiculously said, unstable. Ridiculously unstable. So people have said, well, what if you could put some type of weird matter 
in there to keep it from collapsing. So time travel's possible if we can find an obtanium? If you could find an obtanium, right. So the thing is... Now I'm sad again. Well, no, but there's, there's interesting experiments that hint at the existence of an obtanium. Oh, boy. So there's something called the Casimir effect, which is if you take two plates and, and you put them close together quantum fluctuations are different outside the plates than they are inside the plates and they would actually pull together even though there's nothing there. there okay. Because this is one of those points where I'm saying okay and I okay, have no idea what's going really on. Yeah. yeah, so these quantum fluctuations have some of the properties that this unobtainium mm, would. would need. So could you somehow constrain the, the quantum fluctuations? Uh, we don't them. know. Um, Maybe, okay. probably not. Okay, so here's, and you may not want to go there yet, but the next question that comes to me is, is there anybody working on the engineering problem here? Is there somebody, some physicist or somebody somewhere who in their basement is banging a hammer on something and trying to build a time machine, metaphorically speaking? Yes. There is, really? There's a guy named Ronald Millette. Really? Who is actually was my advisor. <laughs> no, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's he's working on an idea. To build a time machine. Okay, so this guy is a tenured prof- physics he's, professor he's a tenured at professor. a real university. Yes. Wow. What he's done is he's he wrote a paper that showed that light could actually twist space in principle. And okay. Out, so it's basically you make a small rotating universe. Okay. If you have an intense enough laser signal, then then maybe you could twist it enough. To create time loops or time distortions. Okay. Now, where the debate is, is within his solution, he, in order to solve the, the physics, he has a point, which is called a singularity. So he mm-hmm. has a mathematical singularity. If you didn't have that point, would you still have the time loops? It's not clear. So Millette thinks, yes, it would, because the, the mathematical singularity doesn't matter. Other people would say, well, no, it, it really is different topologically, so it, right. would, it would matter. His idea is to use lasers to warp space, and he is trying to gather funding for this, and there are experimentalists that are working with him, and he may build a time machine. Wow. Or at least a time distortion device. Okay, um, so I, a question that literally just occurred to me is everything we've talked about so far with the time loops is you start at point A, and the time loop goes forward, but then loops back to time A again. Right. So all the time travel we've talked about seems to be limited to going back in time as opposed to going forward. Right. Because for, forward in time is easy. We all do it at one second per second. I had no idea that this is a different problem. So yeah. going back in time is one physical problem or one right. theoretical problem, and going forward in time is a different theoretical problem? Right. Well, the, the, the going now forward my... in time is not a theoretical problem at all. We experience a forward motion of time, basically. Yes. So, you know, you can say, in, in relativity, our timelines continue forward into the future. And, oh. and we experience that flow of time. And we can make them go faster by moving faster. Right. So you could, for example, if you went into a rocket, you could go into a rocket, take off at, you know, close to the speed of light, go accelerating, turn around and come back. I would see the journey take 30 years, for example. Mm -hmm. For you, it would take a week if you went fast enough. Now, that's in principle. Mm -hmm. Getting that kind of energy to go that fast would be, you know, almost insurmountable. But that's an engineering problem, not a theoretical problem. Right. That's one of the things where we say, go ahead, engineers, and make it so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, It's perfectly valid within what we know of real physics that traveling forward in time, if you could just get Fast. fast enough for a long enough period of time, you could travel forward in time however much you want. Wow. So you could go 30 years into the future from 1985 to 2015 in a week would be easy compared to doing backwards. Backward. Okay. And and it's the backwards that we just, it's that, that moving backwards, changing the direction of time relative to other time. Right. That's the hard part. And, okay. And when we talk about time machines... That's really what we're talking about. Okay, so when you said changing the direction of time, so my perception of time as linear and unidirectional going right. forward. Your time would always be that way. But somehow, your timeline has to loop back on itself. It, it has to go back mm-hmm. to some starting point where you were. And that's how you get you know, the closed timeline curve. That's how you get that loop. That's how I can go back to being 14 and not making a doofus of myself in front of that really pretty girl. Right. Got it. And But what's interesting is that that raises 
a lot of metaphysical problems as well. Because as soon as you can go back in time, then could you change the past? Could well, you, you know, this this is where you know all the the Marty McFly thing. His whole point is he's trying to change time because he's got the little photograph and he's trying to make sure that he, her, his mom and his dad get busy in the car right. so he doesn't cease to exist. Right. Is that even remotely real? Well, in, in in some sense, it's it's interesting in the way people have dealt with time travel. The the Back to the Future time travel idea is if you go back in time, you will change the course of history. Now, the closest thing in physics to to that that we have is something known as the multiverse. Okay. So the idea in quantum mechanics is that in any time you have a quantum outcome, um, it's probabilistic. Right. You could, I can say, well, 30% of the time it will be this, mm-hmm. 70% of the time it will be that, but I can't tell you anything beyond that. Right. It's only probabilistic. And it's not just because I don't have the knowledge. It's that I physically cannot get the knowledge. The knowledge simply isn't there. All right. So the, the, the quantum system is inherently probabilistic. So this is kind of a Schrodinger's cat kind of problem? Kind of a Schrodinger's cat problem. Okay. We don't like that probabilistic approach. We'd love to have a more deterministic approach like yeah. Newton. One of the ideas is that if you have a quantum outcome, if you have a quantum measurement, all outcomes occur, but they become detached from each other. Okay. And so in a very simplistic way... Anytime you make a quantum measurement, the universe splits into one in which one outcome occurred and one in which the other outcome occurred. So in Marty McFly's case, he goes back to 1955 and by going back to 1955 creates an entirely new universe in which right. Marty McFly as a child doesn't exist. Right. He taps into another universe. Yeah. And, and it doesn't exist. And but so the he, original quote original, although that's a weird concept given the context we're talking in, mm-hmm. the original universe where his parents are their parent, his parents in 1985, that one goes on its merry way. Right. Unaffected. Right, right. So right. how often would you create a new universe? Every single time there is any quantum measurement, you would have another universe yeah. split. Okay. It's not, I mean, you're not creating universes per se. The universe was in a quantum state in which the future was undecided. And then whenever the outcomes, you have this it spits detachment out another possibility. of possibilities. And the number of detachments is theoretically infinite. Yes. So I walk out the door to this room and I turn left in one universe, I turn right, another universe. Right. Yeah, that's just wrong. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it leads, you know, people don't like it because then every possible outcome occurs. So you have every possible heaven and every possible hell. Yeah, the yeah. The best no. in the possible. Yeah, worst yeah, possible yeah. It's worlds. the best possible world, worst possible. Right, yeah. right. And so so that that's one of the kind of common ones. Okay. And, and typically what they would do is they say, if you go back in time, you change it. And then the effects ripple forward so that however you want to say it. Whatever outcome becomes the real outcome, it collapses away all the other universes. So that's the kind of time cop thing. Yeah. You travel back in time, yeah. and then if you, something changes, it ripples forward. In Back to the Future, the fading picture, picture yeah. is, is that kind is of that consequence. Yeah. yeah, right. I, don't like that. I don't like that either. So, so that's, that's kind of one view. In, in relativity, the other view is no matter what you do, the, the time will be self-consistent. Because if there's only one universe, okay. then whatever is there or could happen or will happen is happened. It is have happened. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the only constraint is that all timelines would have to be self-consistent. I couldn't go back in time and prevent my parents from meeting. But I be- could go back in time and cause my parents to meet. So I could go back in time and try to kill my father before he gets married, wound him instead, he ends up in the hospital, and, and the kind nurse who nurses him back happens to be my mother. All right, so oh. so if my current timeline is my parents met, they had three children, and I'm one of them, mm-hmm. I cannot go back in time and prevent that from happening. Right. And in fact, if I try, the universe in some quasi-magical way will warp what I have done and make sure that what has to happen will happen. Right. You cannot change the past any more than you could step off of a cliff and say, don't fall. Can you tweak it a little or not? In, in the self-consistency one, you can't. Whatever has been done has been done. And so not only are my parents still going to be married and still have three kids, Marty McFly's mom is still an alcoholic and his dad's still a dweeb. Right. And right. there's nothing he can do to change that. Exactly. So going back in time is pointless and stupid. Well, but except that it, it can cause the outcomes to be different. I mean, I mean, it can cause the outcomes to be what they're going to be. 
that wouldn't have happened without Time Machine. <laughs> so a, a, a good one would be another 80s movie, uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Actually, one I I have to admit I like more than back okay. to back. That may be heresy, so, so, but I love but, Bill and Ted. But in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Rufus comes back mm-hmm. in time to see Bill and Ted. Yes. Because they're going off track. They're, right. they're, they're not going to become the great rock stars yeah. that they need to become. And future society depends upon their transformative music. Yes. So this is where they have picked up the philosophy of be excellent to each other and party mm-hmm. on dudes. In order to keep that happening... Bill and Ted have to pass their history class. So Rufus goes back in time to give them the time machine so that they can pass history. Okay, here's the thing, though. In the Consistent Universe version of this, they're going to pass history. They did they pass did history. did pass history. But they pass history because Rufus went back in time to allow them to pass history. You see, this sounds both <laughs> infinitely more mind-bending and confusing, but also much more reasonable. It is. And what's interesting is Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is actually one of the best time travel movies in terms of scientific accuracy. <laughs> I just like the story, but okay. Well, and they also they also allude to this because in in the beginning of the movie, one of their dads is looking for the keys, and they can't yes. find the keys, and can't find the keys. Right. Later in the movie, they need the keys, keys. in order to break through Napoleon yeah. and, yeah, and, Freud and yeah. all of that stuff. So they say, "Well, what if we take Dad's keys mm-hmm. and hide it in this drawer?" Then we'll know where they are. Then we'll know where they are. And they open up the door and there are the keys. And in fact, that is what happened because in the future, dad can't find his keys. Exactly. So it's perfectly self-consistent. And then they even raise this question. Well, wait, now that we've done this, what if we don't go back and... No, no, no. Let's not think about that. <laughs> so, And that raises the other question is that if, if there's only one universe and the past and future have already happened, if it's deterministic, there's no free will. None. The future is already written as rigidly as the past. Yes. And that's why a lot of people don't like this idea. Yeah, there would the free will evaporates. It would have yeah. to. It has to, because there's only one outcome. Because what even if there's only one outcome, are there infinite ways to get to that outcome? So I could go back in time and shoot my father, he doesn't die, and now in in the right. consist, self consistent universe, my mother was the caring nurse. I changed my behavior. I exercised free will, but the outcome itself has not changed. Well, That's a version the, the, of free will. The variation please. on that is the outcome may be set, mm-hmm. but you don't know what all of the outcome is. So, so the movie Twelve Monkeys, for example, mm-hmm. we're going to try and stop this apocalypse from happening, but they have incomplete information. Right, and so when when the things fall into place all becomes revealed in terms of what the outcome actually is. Right. And so it's self-consistent, but with limited knowledge. So there is at least a perception of free will. Right. There's a perception of free will in terms right. of maybe those things are uncollapsed in a quantum yeah. state or something. And by the actions that we take, the ultimate outcome is, is foregone, but the road to get there, which is what we honestly care about anyway, right. could be altered. Right. All right. Right. So there's that all those problems... That, that exist within time travel stuff. We've been talking with Dr. Grant Guthiel, Associate Professor of Psychology at Nazareth College. Our program is produced by Mark Gillespie at the Rochester Institute of Technology with support from the RIT College of Science. I'm your host, Brian Corberline. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time. Mm-hmm.